This is video number four on our extended series on the taxation of estates, gifts, and trusts. Let's talk about the form 706, which is the estate tax return. An estate tax return is filed using form 706. Remember, six feet under. If a person is six feet under, they file the form 706. Form 709 is for gifts. So remember the difference between those two form numbers. The estate tax return is due nine months after the death of the decedent. So there's no set due date for this one, people. It's nine months after the date of death to the day. A six month extension is allowed. The maximum estate tax rate is 40%. It's actually a graduated rate, but if you have a person who dies and they have $100 million in assets and their estate is subject to the estate tax, then a large portion of that is probably going to be subject to the 40% tax rate, which is, which is huge. The estate tax rate is very high, 40% which is why so many wealthy people transfer their money to charitable trusts or their assets into offshore trusts and all that, all that other stuff because they're trying to avoid this, the estate tax. The applicable estate tax rate is applied to derive a tentative tax from which any gift tax is paid or payable are subtracted to determine the gross estate tax. The basic exclusion amount is the amount that we were talking about at the beginning of these webinars. This is the amount that you can exclude from estate tax. In 2021, it's $11.7 million. If you die and your assets are worth less than $11.7 million, then your estate is not gonna be subject to estate tax and the estate does not have to file the form 706. The deceased spousal unused exclusion. This is also called the DSUE. This is the unused portion of the decedent's predeceased spouse's basic exclusion amount. The DSUE is not the same thing as the unlimited marital transfer. It's not the same as the marital deduction either. The DSUE is a separate thing entirely. The DSUE is an election that the surviving spouse can make. So this is the unused portion of the decedent's predeceased spouse's basic exclusion. And this sounds a lot like complicated legal terms, but basically what predeceased spouse means is just the one that died first. That's all, <laughs> that's all it means. Cause we're all going to die, right? We're all going to eventually be deceased. The one that's predeceased of the two spouses is the one that went first. Okay. The one that went first, the DSUE, is basically the amount of the exclusion that wasn't used up by the spouse that already died, okay? This is the portability election. Basically, the survivor can say, oh, my deceased spouse didn't use that up, so <laughs> I'm going to port it over to me. I'm going to transfer it to me. And if the surviving spouse elects the DSUE, and transfers that unused exclusion to themselves, then that means basically that their estate tax exclusion is gonna be higher because they're taking the unused exclusion that their deceased spouse didn't use. Okay, and I'm gonna give you an example, all right? It's always good to basically elect the DSUE, especially if you have two wealthy spouses. It's a very good idea. But in order to claim the DSUE, the surviving spouse or the executor for the decedent, the deceased spouse, has to file a form 706. There's no other way to do it. So even if the deceased spouse's estate doesn't have a filing requirement, in order to claim the DSUE to benefit the surviving spouse, a form 706 has to be filed by the executor of the estate or the survivor or the surviving spouse who intends to transfer the DSUE. Okay. This is regardless of the amount of the gross estate. In order to take the DSUE and make the portability election, a Form 706 has to be filed by either the surviving spouse or the executor of the estate. And of course, this is only going to apply if the taxpayer was married at the time of death because you're transferring the deceased spouse's unused exclusion to the surviving spouse. You can't transfer 
this exclusion to like a child or any other beneficiary of the estate. This is only for married couples. Estate tax return due date. Now remember an estate tax return, the form 706 is due nine months after the date of death. And I think you need to know that for the test. Remember that for the test. It's a really odd due date. It's not any kind of hard deadline like April 15th. The estate tax return, the form 706 is due nine months after the date of death. And the executor can request a six month extension. Okay. Example, Stefan is a US citizen who lives in Spain. He owns several properties in Spain, as well as assets in the United States. On July 1st, 2021, Stefan dies. At the time of his death, Stefan's assets in Spain included three vacation homes and a waterfront villa. Waterfront villa in Spain, sounds fantastic, right? Anyway, the fair market value of these properties at the time of his death was $9 million. Stefan also owned US investments and a vacation home in Miami, Florida. His US assets totaled approximately 5 million at the time of his death. Stefan's estate has a filing requirement because his combined assets are worth more than 11.7 million. So you have to combine all of the taxpayers worldwide assets, everything that they owned when they died in order to figure out if their estate has a filing requirement. And his assets in Spain were $9 million. And then his US assets were $5 million. So you add that up, that's $14 million. So his estate has a filing requirement. Doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna be subject to estate tax, but a form 706 has to be filed. All the assets must be reported on the estate tax return, including any foreign assets, and any amount over the exclusion may potentially be subject to estate tax. Now, an estate tax return is similar to any other type of return because estates can have deductions too. So just because the value of a taxpayer's assets upon death are more than this amount, that $11.7 million exclusion, that doesn't necessarily mean that the estate is going to be subject to estate tax. It just means that for sure an estate tax return has to be filed. Okay. His estate tax forms, his estate tax return, the form 706 would be due on April 1st, 2022. So he died on July 1st, 2021 and April 1st, 2022 is nine months after his death, right? So July, August, September, October, November, December, January, February, March, April. Okay. Nine months after the date of his death, that's when the estate tax return is due and a six month extension is available. Okay. Odd deadline. Remember nine months for that 706. Okay. It's not the same for the form 1041 because that's an income tax return. This is the estate tax return. And remember, this is only filed one time, once to report the assets of the decedent, the value of the assets of the decedent on the date of their death. Estate income tax return. Now we're talking about the form 1041, not the form 1040, the form 1041. An estate is a taxable legal entity that exists from the time of an individual's death until all of the assets have been distributed to the decedent's beneficiaries. Now, sometimes people die and they don't own anything. And then in that case, you don't have an estate. But most of the time when people die, they own something. You know, they own a house, they own a car, they have money in the bank. That's their estate. Okay, that's their estate. And if the estate earns any amount of substantial revenue after the taxpayer's death, then the form 1041 is likely to have to be filed for the estate. Most estates are administered and distributed within 12 to 18 months. This is the average for like a modest estate. But sometimes when the decedent was a very wealthy person, or if the estate is in litigation, like the Michael Jackson estate, which we're still gonna talk about, the estate may not terminate for years and sometimes even decades. Now the IRS does expect an estate to not be unnecessarily prolonged. That's the, <laughs> that's the IRS verbiage. They don't like it when an estate is unnecessarily prolonged. But reality is that many times if an estate is in litigation, like let's say the beneficiaries are arguing 
or if it's a situation like the Michael, Michael Jackson estate, when he died, all of his children were minors. At the time of his death, all of his children were minors. They're all adults now because the estate has taken so long in litigation with the IRS. But when he died, his kids were all under the age of 18. So in that case, most of the time when you have a valuable estate like his estate, like the Michael Jackson estate, the estate won't close for several years or even decades. And that's especially true if the beneficiaries are minor children because they'll wait until the children actually come of age, until they turn 18 or 21 at least, until the assets can be distributed to them. I mean, what's a 10 year old gonna do with a rental property? Let's be real. So most modest estates, they're distributed and terminated within a year to 18 months. But if you have a very wealthy person, or if you have a person who dies and they have valuable assets, but the beneficiaries of the state are minor children, then sometimes those estates will take much longer to distribute. The Form 1041 is an annual income tax return. It's very similar to the Form 1040 that natural persons file every single year that they're earning income. Once a taxpayer dies, if their assets continue to generate revenue through the years, then a Form 1041 has to be filed annually as long as the assets continue to generate revenue and assuming that they're not distributed to the beneficiaries because an estate can't close and the final Form 1041 can't be filed until all of the assets are distributed to the beneficiaries and all of the estate's liabilities are paid. So this is an annual income tax return similar to the return of an individual or a business. Form 706 is different. The estate tax return is different. So this is the Form 1041 is the income tax return, the estate income tax return. The Form 706 is the estate tax return. It's not an income tax return. Instead, it is a form used to calculate estate taxes only. Depending on the value of an estate and the income that it generates, both forms may need to be filed. Or in the case of a small estate, neither form may have to be filed. It all depends on the facts and circumstances. A decedent's assets will often continue to earn revenue after a taxpayer has died. This income, such as rents, dividends, and interest must be reported on the Form 1041. The Schedule K-1, Schedule K-1 is used to report any income that is distributed or distributable to each beneficiary and is filed with the Form 1041 with a copy also given to the beneficiary. In this regard, it's somewhat similar to a partnership return. So the, the entity, the estate, is going to report any income and loss on the Form 1041. And then any income that is distributed or distributable to the beneficiary is reported on the Schedule K-1. And then the beneficiary reports that income on the Schedule E, page 2 of the Schedule E. That's where it's reported. The due date for the Form 1041 is the 15th day of the fourth month following the end of the entity's tax year. This is April 15th for a calendar year entity. If you have a calendar year entity, calendar year estate, then it's going to be April 15th. But the extension period is weird. It's not six months for the Form 1041. The extension is five and a half months. And you can request an extension by filing Form 7004, which is the same extension form that partnerships and corporations use, but the extension period is different. It's not six months. It's five and a half months for whatever reason. So <laughs> the extended due date is not October 15th. <laughs> All right. The tax year of an estate may be either a calendar or a fiscal year subject to the election made at the time the first return is filed. An election will also be made on the first return as to the method to report the estate's income. So cash, accrual, or other. So an estate can use the cash method or the accrual method or any of the other methods that are available to businesses, like the hybrid method. And let's say it's a situation where it's a farmer that dies and the farmer was using the crop method. And then the farm itself, the business, passes to the estate. Then the estate can also use any other method of accounting that the business itself was using. All right, so the states can use the same accounting methods that any other business can or that taxpayers can. Most of the time it's gonna be cash. 
but they can the estate can use other acceptable methods of accounting as well. Form 1041 must be filed for any domestic estate estate that has gross income for the tax year of $600 or more or a beneficiary who is a non-resident alien with any amount of income. And I think you need to remember this for the test. Whenever you have a situation where it's a question about a trust or an estate, if there's a beneficiary who's a non-resident alien, then the estate has to file an income tax return, regardless of the amount of income that the estate has, even if it's just a dollar. Just having a beneficiary that's a non-resident alien is going to trigger a filing requirement for that estate, or if it's a trust, for that trust as well. The non-resident alien being a beneficiary is going to trigger a filing requirement, regardless of the amount of the gross income that comes in. Distributable net income. You need to know what distributable net income is. As I said before, estates and trusts are like hybrid pass-through entities. There's no double taxation with estates and trusts. Income can be taxed at the estate or trust level, or it can be taxed to the, to the beneficiaries, but it's never gonna be taxed to both of both. It's not like a C-Corp where income is taxed at the entity level and then income is also taxed at the shareholder level when the dividends are issued to the shareholders. It's not like that. There's no double taxation, but it's also not like a partnership where everything passes through. So estates and trusts, are different. You can have an estate or a trust where the income is taxed at the entity level, and you can also have the income taxed at the beneficiary level or both. You can have a situation where the estate or the trust retains a little bit of income and then passes most of it through, which to be honest is generally what happens. So many times a little bit of income will be retained and then the remainder will be passed through and it's going to be taxed either at the entity level or at the beneficiary level. Like the beneficiary will report it on their own tax return, but it's never gonna be taxed in both places, okay? The distributable net income is the income that is currently available for distribution, that's DNI. So this is the income that the estate or the trust has coming in for the year. The income distribution deduction or the IDD is allowed to trusts and estates for amounts that are paid, credited, or required to be distributed to beneficiaries. So in simple terms, what this means is that IDD is a deduction that the estate or the trust gets to take on the income that's being distributed to the beneficiary, because that means that the beneficiary is going to pay tax on it on their own tax return. So that's why <laughs> the estate or the trust gets to take a deduction for it. It's not really a tax deduction, but the estate or the trust has to have some way of telling the IRS, hey, uh, the estate or the trust is not paying tax on this. The beneficiary is going to pay tax on it. So the income distribution deduction is basically how that happens. The income is going to be passed through and then the beneficiary is going to pay tax on it on their own income tax return on the form 1040, right? On the schedule E, that's where the beneficiary is gonna pay tax on it. But the income is never gonna be taxed in two places. There's just one level of taxation with an estate or a trust, but it's not like any other entity type. It's not like a business entity where it either is gonna get all passed through or like a C Corp where it's not gonna get passed through at all because a C Corp is not a pass through. So estates and trusts are like hybrid entities where the income either can be retained or it can be passed through. The estate or the trust can pay tax on it or the beneficiary can pay tax on it, but never both. Okay. All right. Net investment income tax. So estates and trusts are subject to the net investment income tax, just like individuals are. So they're kind of unique in that way because other entity types are not subject to the net investment income tax. But as I said in the last slide, estates and trusts can pay tax on the income that they earn. And if they do, then there's a possibility that the estate or the trust is gonna get hit with the net investment income tax if the estate or the trust has net investment income above certain thresholds. Now, the thresholds for estates and trusts 
where the estate or the trust is going to have to pay this tax is much, much lower than the thresholds for individual taxpayers. It's much, much lower. So in general, what ends up happening is the estate or the trust is going to pass through most of its investment income to the beneficiaries. But if the estate or the trust chooses to retain it, then they might actually be um, subject to the net investment income tax. And it's 3.8%. It's the same tax rate as it is for individual taxpayers, but it's a much lower threshold. And the thresholds are in your book. I don't think you need to know that for the test, but I do think you need to know that estates and trusts are subject to this tax, just like individual taxpayers are. But other t entity types like partnerships, corporations, those entity types are not subject to the NIT, but individual taxpayers are subject to the NIT and then estates and trusts are also subject to the NIT. Okay, so they're unusual in this way. For estates and trusts, the tax applies to the lesser of the undistributed net investment income or the excess of adjusted gross income over the threshold amount at which the highest tax bracket begins. And now we're talking about ta the tax brackets that apply to estates and trusts themselves. Okay, the NIT does not apply to tax exempt trusts or to grantor trusts. Okay, the NIT doesn't apply to tax exempt trusts because they're tax exempt. What they're talking about is like a charitable trust or a tax exempt trust. Many times, exempt entities are organized as trusts. But if it's a tax exempt trust, then the NIT doesn't apply. And then the NIT also doesn't apply to grantor trusts because in general, grantor trusts are disregarded. They're just used for avoiding probate. And if a grantor trust earns, you know, investment income, like dividends or interest, then that's just going to be taxed on the individual form 1040 of the grantor. They're just, they're treated like disregarded entities 99% of the time. Form 1041 example. Matthew owned three rental properties before his death on June 1st. So Matthew is the decedent, okay? And he died on June 1st, but he owned three rental properties. The gross value of his assets on the date of Matthew's death was $2 million. So he had a valuable estate, but it wasn't so valuable that an estate tax return has to be filed. It was worth less than the estate exemption amount. So an estate tax return, the form 706, does not have to be filed for Matthew's estate. The income from the rental properties that was received while he was alive would be reported on his final form 1040 Schedule E. The rental income that was received by his estate after his death would be reported on form 1041 annual tax return for estates and trusts. Okay, do you see how this works? So he had a valuable estate and it included rental properties. After a person dies, if they own rental properties, those renters are not going to magically disappear. Those rental properties are gonna to continue to earn revenue. And if, for example, he was unmarried at the time of his death, let's say he had heirs, but they were like something like a sibling, then those rental properties are not going to be distributed to those siblings or those children. If he had children, they're not going to be distributed to those people right away. So yes, there's an estate and somebody has to be reporting the income that continues to come into the estate until those rental properties can be distributed to the heirs or the beneficiaries of Matthew's estate. Until that happens, there's an estate and the form 1041 has to be filed. Example, estate administration. Geneva Jones is a popular writer with many best-selling novels. She is unmarried and has no children, but has five adult siblings. Geneva dies without a will on January 19th at age 52. The estimated value of her estate exceeds $25 million. So Geneva Jones has a very valuable estate. And she also wrote a number of novels during her lifetime that continue to generate revenue even after her death. Many times after a famous author or a famous musician dies, there'll actually be a surge of popularity immediately after their death or, you know, a few weeks after their death. And maybe their novels or their music weren't selling as well before, but as once they pass away, there'll be like an, an additional surge of popularity immediately after. So in this case, 
the estimated value of her estate exceeds $25 million, and her novels continue to sell briskly after her death. Geneva's siblings are her only living relatives and therefore equal heirs of her estate. The siblings immediately start to squabble over their late sister's assets. All five siblings petition to be named the executor. The probate court is forced to appoint a professional executor, and the litigation will likely drag on for years. And this is not uncommon. This is not uncommon, where if there's no clear executor or if a very famous person or a famous writer like this dies without a will, this is exactly what happened with Prince, the famous singer. They, they, he had seven siblings, I think, and he died without a will. He had no living children. He, he did have a child during his life, lifetime, but the child unfortunately died. So he didn't have any children and he was unmarried at the time of his death and he died without a will. So his siblings were his heirs. The court basically had to appoint a professional executor because it was a mess. He died without a will. There was no clear heirs. The uh, uh, hundreds of people came forward saying that they were related to him. There had to be DNA tests. I mean, it was a, like a circus, literally like a circus. So many times this will happen. And what ends up happening is the court, the probate court, will appoint a professional executor, basically to preserve the rights of the estate itself when all of these potential heirs are squabbling or fighting over the assets of the estate. And then the litigation will drag on for years, which means basically that the estate administration will go on for years. The form 706 has to be followed by the professional executor and the form 1041 will have to continue to be filed for years and years and years while the litigation continues. Okay, this is not an uncommon scenario when you have a wealthy person that dies without a will, especially. So the estate is generating revenue during this time. So the form 1041 will need to be filed every single year to report the ongoing income of the estate until the legal dispute be between the siblings is resolved. I want you to understand this conceptually. Like Geneva Jones in this example is the author. While she was alive, she presumably reported the income that she was earning from her novels on her form 1040. But after a person dies, there's no more form 1040s. You don't file a form 1040 for a dead person. The last form 1040 that gets filed is in the year of death, but she's a famous author or she was. So her novels are gonna continue to generate revenue for years and years and years. So that income has to be reported somewhere. And since the siblings in this example are all heirs to her estate, but they're fighting, then that means that none of these assets are gonna be distributed. The assets are like the copyrights and the novels themselves. That's intellectual property. And as of right now, in this scenario, it's owned by the estate because none of those assets, the copyrights themselves, can be distributed to the heirs which are her siblings, until they stop fighting. And the litigation in a probate court, especially if a famous person dies without a will, can drag on for years and even decades. That income has to be reported somewhere. So it's reported on the Form 1041, that income. And then the value of the estate itself, right? She died and the estimated value of her estate exceeds $25 million, as it says in this example. That's, you know, the value of her cars, her bank accounts, her investments, and then the value of the copyrights themselves. The books that she wrote during her lifetime that are gonna continue to earn money after her death. That's all part of her estate. And since it's worth $25 million, as it says in this example, the Form 706 has to be filed too, and her estate is probably going to be subject to estate tax. So there's an there's estate tax in this scenario, and there's also income tax in this scenario, because the income that the estate is generating is going to be subject to tax too. Okay, until all of this is resolved, the Form 1041 has to be filed every single year as the estate continues to earn revenue. This is an extended series continued in the next video. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to get notifications for our tax law updates.